Um, my name is uh, Yu Ming, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Telnix. Um, so today I'm giving a talk about uh, wrapping all of your databases. Uh, sorry, disclaimer, just wrapping one kind of database for today. Um, I'm going to move on and talk about the, uh, what our agenda is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about databases, and I'm going to talk about what exactly are the libraries that are available to us. Um, and in each, each like, in the ecosystem, I'm breaking it down to like three different sections um, because they kind of like fit a different kind of um, use case. Um, so, so basically, what are databases and what's a DBMS? So if you Google anywhere, go through um, any dictionary, without fail, the usual, de usual um, definition is a database is an organized collection of data, generally for a computer to consume. So um, it's basically just data, just organized. Um, yeah. So different kinds of use cases for databases are like storing catalogs of data. So if you have movie reviews, restaurant reviews, all sorts of things. You would store that. You'd capture logs, metrics. You could use databases for that. If you guys build web applications that you know, require people to like log in or uh, register, you'd also store those kind of, that kind of information in databases. You can store graphs and uh, even store knowledge, uh, from in particular for things like expert systems and a lot of more use cases. But databases by themselves aren't very useful because you need to be able to like expose it so other 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 applications can use it. So a database management system is what uh, performs this duty. Um, it does stuff for storing data, retrieving data, um, and catalog data. Basically, um, you know, adding metadata like comments. What exactly is the schema? Does the schema look like? It it also includes transactional and concurrency support. So if multiple users try to use it at once. Uh, we don't. They don't step on each other. Um, it also offers things for like recovering from disaster. So like if the database goes down, this database management system needs to be able to you know go back to a known, previously known good state. Um, if, if you have multi users, you want to make sure that the right people access your data. Um, and you know most of these things like are probably sitting on a separate server. So like you need to be able to like have other services be able to communicate with this uh, database. So database management systems sort of like kind of started from the 60s. Um, we first, uh, as computer scientists, we start, first started off with navigational databases. Um, navigational databases are like, they, they <laughs> think of it as, uh, as your data is on a tape. And all, all the navigational database does is like go left and right, left and right, go to, go to, go to. And so in the 70s, people were like, okay, well, it's great that I, have, I can access my data, but you know, I can't really find stuff just using GoTo all the time. I really need to look for stuff like, you know, that be, let's say like all the movies that begin with a letter M, for example. And so re relational databases start showing up, and they kind of took off in like the 80s and 2000s. And nowadays, um, there's even more and more different kinds of databases that challenge the relational model. Um, but today we're going to focus on Postgres. Um, actually, Postgres has uh, its roots in Ingress. It's um, by uh, Stonebaker and UC Berkeley back in the 70s. He first started Ingress. And then after doing a bunch of research into relational database, he, found, he figured, okay, well, let's try to make Postgres, uh, which had all the, all the, which fixed all the warts that Ingress has. Um, Postgres is a, um, kind of what we use here at Telnix. Um, a lot of our data stores are backed by Postgres. It's pretty reliable. So basics of uh, Postgres, it's a SQL-based querying language. So you use SQL queries, like select, insert, delete, update. Um, it features asset transactions. Basically, if I want to execute a, a series of, um, of commands, like let's say a series of like uh, 10 inserts, like if there's something blows up in between, in between that, like I want like database to be fresh. Um, Postgres also has some other stuff like stored procedures, views, triggers, JSON, columns, KV stores, and a lot of stuff that probably won't touch today. So how do we use Postgres with Python? 
So uh, the, knee, the knee jerk reaction for this for most Python people is that, oh, there's a library for this. Yeah, I and mean, it's true, there's a lot of libraries. Like there's so many libraries that um, I'll, I'll go on. So before we talk about libraries, let's talk about um, you know, standards because I think like as developers, it's really important that we have a concrete standard that we abide to so that when people build libraries, like there's n none of that impedance for, for people to implement. So PEP 249 is, um, it's actually a PEP that's like back in the two, early 2000s, like I think it's 2001, 2003, I don't remember. But basically they defined a standard database API. Um, it consists of having connection. So connections are like the objects that like maintain whether or not you're connected to the actual database. So they do all the, um, the handshakes and say making sure that like, hey, am I still connected with, uh, with Postgres? And so once you're connected, you can call cursor and cursor on connection, and cursor basically gives you, um, if you guys use like the file, the uh, file APIs for Python, when you read stuff, there's like a cursor that goes through the files, right? So cursor, the cursor class is kind of similar to that, like when you do a select statement, um, that cursor keeps track of like where in the result, results that you're, you're in. Um, it also, ha PEP 249 also defines like exceptions, general exceptions that like um, all databases should, no matter what kind of wrapper library should implement so that they can capture like any of the nuances uh, inside the database. And uh, they also it also defines optionally um, a transactional interfa interfaces for like two-phase transactions. So imagine like you have transactions on top of transactions, meaning like you have, um, you actually have a transaction that spans across multiple applications and two-phase allows um, just facilitates that to happen. So in the Python ecosystem, I, this is kind of what I came across. Like the, the different kinds of libraries broke into three kinds. There are adapter libraries, query builders, and ORMs. Uh, adapter libraries are, all they do is basically adapt your SQL query, um, your Python, Python integers, um, JSON, or datetime into the relevant, you know, um, the relevant uh, data types in Postgres. Query builders are like, they offer methods so that um, instead of constructing like SQL queries by hand with strings, um, you use these methods to, to call upon stuff to build the query. Um, something nice about that is that you can make dynamic queries that take any kind of input and if you know how to map it to the relevant methods, like you can have very complex queries. ORMs are, object relation mappers, they basically solve the problem where you have Python classes and you have like lots of Postgres records and you need to take Postgres records and like map them to an object. Um, they're pretty heavy, um, but they solve the problem of like having to um, join a lot of data. So um, I think to start off, I'll start off with a adapter library. Uh, PsychoPG2, is everyone familiar with PsychoPG2? Oh great, yeah. So PsychoPG2 is actually like really, really ubiquitous in the Python ecosystem. Um, it's an adapter library that's used in Django, it's used in SQL Alchemy, PeeWee, AOPG, it's, it's a ton. Um, so what is a PsychoPG2? Um, basically it's a, it's a Python library that wraps around the libpqc library and libpq's Postgres actually supplies that. Um, it has a bunch of pooling capabilities, um, and like I said before, if a lot of ORMs like to base their stuff on uh, PsychoPG2. And it follows the PEP249 DP API2 to, uh, to a T, basically. So I actually have a demo for this, of uh, how to use this. Um, so in this demo, I'm going to construct a recipe API. Um, it's kind of generic, but it, um, it's a kind of example that lets me flesh out some of these different kinds of relationships between data. And let me see if I can reset this. One second. Okay, cool. So let's see a DB, DB API 2 in action. So I'm gonna import this. Um, there are multiple ways you can connect to the database. Um, the one I like to use is using the DSN, and DSN is usually you specify the protocol, username, uh, password, 
the host and the port and the database name all in one go. The other way I could, you could do that is uh, actually break it up. Uh, you can have host, port, user, password, DB name. That also works too. Uh, actually, I'm going to need these two connections for something I'm going to demonstrate later. Sorry about that. So when constructing tables, um, yeah, Postgres uses schemas. So um, you need to really define every single uh, one of the columns uh, pretty explicitly. Um, there are data types in there. So serial is actually an integer that has auto increment a sequence attached to it. So when you insert you know, more records into this, it's going to auto increment something. And I've set this to be a primary key so that this uniquely identifies like a recipe. Um, they have timestamps. And you can also set default values, which I set it to now. Um, same thing here with ingredients. It's kind of similar to recipes. And this one's a little special. Um, this one ties ingredients to recipes. Um, and they also have like this quantity numeric. Can't be null. Uh, it has also units, because we need units with quantities. And so let me run this guy. All right. So it didn't say anything, so I think that's good. I think. So when you insert um, data in Psycho PG2, um, they give you a facility to like take data, the um, input data, and like inject it into the this SQL SQL command that you write. Um, I think in in general, like this will try to scrub any any like SQL injection kind of attacks. Um, Data libraries also include that uh, for free. And so I'm gonna run this guy. Okay, so, and now I want to pull the data back because um, you store data, that's great, but we need to get it back somehow. So um, I'm, I have two connections here. I'm going to have connection one, which I used up here to insert the data. I'm going to run this. And there. So it kind of looks like uh, all my data is there. But if I use PG connection two, it's not there. Now why is that? Oh, what? Thank you. That's it. So like, I completely forgot to hit commit here because like, Postgres is like acid compliant. Like, you have to like commit things if you start things. Like, you got to tell it to commit. Uh, but if you set the auto commit flag to true, um, every command that you execute, it's gonna like commit it. But I didn't set it to true. So um, in this case, uh, it's it didn't actually commit to the database. So one connection sees the data I just inserted, but the other didn't. That's the isolation property of like. Oh, cool. So it's basically isolation. So um, you don't want, if you're in the middle of doing something, you don't want other like connect people to see it. There's actually nuances to how Postgres deals with the locks to actually let people see these things. But in this example, I, I just don't let people see it. So the second connection doesn't see the, the rows I just inserted. So uh, let's just start all over again. So in Postgres, there's something that you can do is uh, you can actually return the, whatever you want back from after you do an insert uh, command, for example. So one of the things that I like to return is like the ID that got auto-generated, because I will need it later. Um, so let's do that. So when um, Postgres executes things with like a returning, um, you can actually fetch on it. It's a using the cursor um, that will get you the and you if you take the zeroth item, it will get you back the thing you dis, you wanted to return. And so here we have like a list of IDs <laughs> that I got back. Um, updating data is kind of similar to insert, um, except you use the update command, and you can inject it as well. Um, I'm going to go rename one of these to fish and just, ex just execute this. And you can see that it, get, it got, got updated. And I'm just going to delete that guy and run this again. Yeah. So yeah, PsychoBG2, that's kind of basically the bare bones of what it does. So let's suppose I want to like model the recipe API with like classes. 
um, <clears throat> I, I want to expose like some sort of API for other people to use like this, da this data store I just created. And so I create this um, ingredient with ID name created at has its own REPL, I mean wrapper magic method, um, recipe ingredient, and then in the recipe it has a list of these recipe ingredients. So let me run that. And let me put, put in some ingredients for a nice beef wellington. Okay, and that ran. So when you when you try to grab this with like PsychoPG2, you're, you're going to get a, like lists and lists and lists of like records. And if you want to hydrate the data um, into this kind of form, um, you're going to have to do a lot of like for loops and executing like the selects for that particular things to join the data together. Um, yeah, this is kind of like a quite a bit to read, and I don't think I'm going to describe this, but let's just run this. And I lost the screen because of that. That's uh, PsychoBG2. It's really good for um, you know um, one-off scripts. And it actually, the other thing is like it actually acts as a pretty good foundation for other libraries. Um, a lot of libraries, like like I said before, Django, PeeWee, SQL Alchemy, they all use PsychoPG2 as their base. All right, so there are actually other libraries out there that do adapters, like adapting was kind of like a very early problem. Um, there's Piger, Piger S SQL, oh thank you. Really appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks Luis. So there's like PyGraphSQL. This is like really a pretty really early um, adapting library that dates all the way back to 1950, 1995. And it has an old PG like module, but they eventually implemented a DB API 2 um, compliant one. Uh, there's PG 8000. Um, they call it 8000 because they think there were 7,999 Postgres drivers already out there. Um, this is a pure Python Postgres. ProSQL um, driver, it has, you don't need to install libpq in it. So if you don't like installing C libraries, like this, this one's for you. Um, it, yeah, and the way they do it is they implement something called the front end back end PostSQL uh, pro protocol. It's it basically like, how do I uh, take this SQL query and like communicate with the actual database? So there's an actual protocol, like how you send messages to it and like how you send data to it. And it's also DB API, API 2 compliant. So I'm not going to show this because like, I feel like if I show it to you, since it's DB API 2 compliant, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. It's not worth it. So some comments on the adapter libraries. Um, rule of thumb, just use PsychoPG2. Um, everyone uses it. You won't go wrong with it. And it has connection pooling, which the other libraries don't have. Um, if you, you guys familiar with connection pooling? With Postgres, yeah. So like, if you want to pull like a bunch of keep keep a, a bunch of connections alive for like multiple uses, you want you want to use uh, PsychoPG2. Um, the things about about these adaptive libraries is that they don't have that many tools to them. They're difficult to hydrate into Python classes, and they're not very flexible. Like, there's no nothing for me to like dynamically generate the word clauses and all that stuff. And so that's kind of where the ORMs fall into play. Um, the part where it's very difficult to hydrate um, and that there's all tools for stuff. Um, ORMs are uh, basically object relation mappers. They map database records to Python classes. You don't need to handwrite any SQL queries. And in general, they actually handle many kinds of databases, not just Postgres. Uh, I know SQL Alchemy can do like MySQL, like uh, SQL Server, I think. Yeah. So they, I mean, they have like one general generic API. And so let's talk, take a look at the SQL Alchemy. Um, SQL Alchemy has like two parts. Um, the core is the SQL SQL um, query builder. So basically, they give you like methods so that like 
you do select statements and chain where clauses together. So if you have like, um, if you have a REST API that has multiple like um, query parameters, for example, and you sometimes optionally need one or optionally need others, you can use query builders to quick like flexibly build your SQL queries versus like having to do string manipulation. And <clears throat> SQL Alchemy also contains an ORM. So the ORM is actually built on top of the, of the core. Um, it uses the data mapper pattern instead of the active record. Um, anyone heard of active record? Cool. So um, yeah, active record is basically one class, one table, one class, one table, versus data mapper is um, one class could potentially map to multiple tables. So it's a little even higher abstraction to ac active record. <sighs> Great. Okay, so I'm gonna bl blow through this one because um, it's kind of um, it's, it's kind of fast. So in general, with SQL Alchemy, you define like your models, and um, instead of like writing queries, you define your models up front. So it's kind of like defining like in in this one where I did all a bunch of create tables. Um, instead, uh, there's a kind of like a DSL in SQL Alchemy for you to create these models. Um, one of the things that you want to, I want to bring to your attention is um, this relationship guy. Um, this relationship, uh, in the background, SQL Alchemy is keeping track of all these models and how they're related to one another. And they, it does that because um, it wants, when you try to do a join or try to access one of the, let's say, child, cl child cl um, <clears throat> attributes, like it needs to know where does it need to select the data from. Um, so that's what a relationship does. And in this case, this is a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, you, you can define that by um, defining this relationship with this guy, uh, the recipe ingredient, and this one here defines the relationship with the ingredient itself. Um, I think there's a, there's a nicer way to do this, but the reason why I did it this way is because uh, I needed to get the units and the quantity. Uh, this is pretty important information for the recipe. So I'm gonna go connect to this. It works kind of like PsychoPG2. Uh, you just define a DSN, have an engine. I set echo to true so that you can see the SQL queries that run when you um, do use methods in SQL Alchemy. And, oh, that's fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course that doesn't work. So, yeah, so there's this metadata within every single one of them. This is the thing that actually keeps track of the, all the models. Um, I think I, I think I created the, the tables, but I'm not entirely sure. So notice in this example, if I want to insert things, like I don't really need to define it like how, how I did here, all the <clears throat> all the different columns that I want. I just instantiate classes, Python classes. So I, if I run this, um, I should have all the records inside here, and when I get the recipe out, oh no. One second, I'm gonna restart the database. I don't, stuff like this happens. Yeah, when this happens, I gotta restart the database. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so while that's running, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear the output. There's a duplicate there. Oh, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna move on from this because it's like it's all broken. <laughs> um, so basically, um, without really writing a whole bunch of SQL queries, like I I can just like insert stuff into the database and um, SQL Alchemy is smart enough to like figure out hey. Given these objects, like what, what what do I need to insert into the database given this session? Um, <clears throat> if you look above here, there's a session up here, and session is what what keeps track of like what has been written during this time period, and what have I not committed yet? Um, yeah, so it does a, a lot, lot lot of stuff behind the scenes, and if, if this was this demo was working, you would see like in between of accessing a particular attribute, it's going to run like a SQL query. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's SQL Alchemy. It's um, really good for, um, you know, 
dealing with data, <clears throat> data models that are kind of complex. Um, whereas like something like Psycho PG2 is like a little, it's a little harder to work with. Um, there are a bunch of other ORMs. There's Django ORM. So if you're using Django, it's pretty good. Um, if you use it, you get a whole bunch of things out for free, like even an Ammon view. That's nuts. Um, there's Peewee. Um, it uses the active record pattern. So if you're, if you're active records, your 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 guy, you can use Peewee. Okay. And um, in general, just like ORMs are good for like uh, data models that are pretty complex. Don't try to mix ORMs together. Like I don't want to see like like SQL Alchemy, Django, and Peewee all mixed in together. That's not good. Um, you got to be careful with ORMs because um, they could blow up your application if you don't know what, what kind of queries they're running underneath. Um, I think if I have, have enough time, I'll, which I probably don't. Yeah, I'm going to blow through this one. Because uh, anyone here use async I.O.? Oh, cool. So one of the problems with like Psycho PG2 and SQL Alchemy is that like they're blocking. Um, so and for Psycho PG2, they have like async like methods and all that stuff, but like it doesn't follow the await, the await async like syntax. And so these libraries here like offer that, those facilities for async. So the ones that we use, uh, this is very common in, in Telnix, we use AIOPG quite a lot. And it wraps around the cycle BG2s like async, async um, <clears throat> like methods and it provides the async await. And it also has a DB API, API to like an interface. Um, you can't use the ORAM with it, but you can use the, the core query builders with it. And so just a little taste of AOPG. Um, it kind of looks like DB API too. Um, it's just you can, like, they have a, we use a pool, but you can acquire connections from pool, the, the pool and then use cursor and execute your things and you get the cursor API. Um, then the other one is async PG. Um, this is different from AOPG. They don't use Psycho PG too. Um, it actually implements the back, front and back end servers. Um, a protocol. So they do this because they want to be really fast. Anyway, <clears throat> I know everyone's kind of antsy for leaving, so I'm going to give you this one final thought. So this is kind of where I see these different libraries, what roles they play. So if you like lots of high abstraction and you have very complex, large scope applications, go ahead, use the, <clears throat> use the ORMs. Use the SQL Alchemy ORMs and all that stuff. Peewee and SQL Alchemy Core kind of fall in between the simple scripts and the large scripts apps, and that's kind of like where, what they were designed for. And if you, you don't like, if you don't like, um, you know, ORMs or anything like that, you can just go raw with Psycho PG2. It's pretty robust. And if you have the option to, go ahead and use IO PG and Async PG. You can scale up even, fat, even more. Uh, for Pygre SQL and PG8000, like, don't even bother. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so I had, here's the links for all of them. Um, uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, you guys, you got any questions? Hi. Um, just wondering if you have any experience connecting to OLAP cubes rather than directly to database tables and how you find that works. Is, okay, so the question was, um, have, you, have I had any experience connecting to OLAP cubes rather than um, directly to the database? Mm. Uh, to be honest, like, I haven't used it. Is it, is it kind of like a, um, a proxy between Kubernetes and like? So an OLAP cube is kind of like a column store. It's a data model in memory. Um, you use it with Excel for oh. per, like power pivots, things like that. SSAS, Microsoft SSAS. I guess it's off topic. Yeah. I might catch you after. Yeah, I've yeah. never used it before. Sorry, I don't mean to ask you a question. You, you can't answer. It's a genuine question. Yeah. Sorry okay. about that. Sorry. <laughs> I think we're out of time, so I'll let everyone go to the coffee break, and you can thank our speaker and talk to him after if you want. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank